Chapter Five, Part Two of the Uttermost Farthing. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. The Uttermost Farthing by R. Austin Freeman. Chapter Five, Byproducts of Industry, Part Two. Once inside, I made my simple preparations rapidly. Placing the concussor in a tall cylindrical basket close to the cellar door, I opened the latter and hitched the rope in a position where I could grasp it easily. Then I took from the cupboard the tin of cart grease, and, with a large knife, spread a thick layer of the grease on the upper four steps of the cellar stairs. While thus engaged, I turned over my plans quickly, but with considerable misgivings. The odds were greater than I ought to have taken, for, as to the intentions of these men, I could have no reasonable doubt. Bamber was known to me, and he would not run the risk of my giving information. The amiable intention of these gentry was to do me in, as they would have expressed it, and the vital question for me was, how did they mean to do it? Firearms they would probably avoid on account of the noise, but if they all came at me at once with knives my chance would be infinitesimal. It comes back to me now rather oddly that I weighed these probabilities quite impersonally, as though I were a mere spectator. As such was virtually the case. The fact is that, although I had long since abandoned the idea of suicide, I remained alive as a matter of principle, and not by personal desire. My objection to being killed was merely the abstract objection to the killing of any worthy member of society by these human vermin. But if any such person must needs be killed, I was quite indifferent as to whether the subject of the action were myself or some other. I had no personal interest in the matter. Hence, when I unbolted the door and beckoned the three men into the room, though doubtful of the issue, I had no feeling of nervousness. The advantage that my impassiveness gave me over these three rascals was very evident when they slouched in for they were all trembling and twitching with nervous excitement. And no wonder. To a man who values his life above everything on earth, it is a serious matter to walk into the very shadow of the gallows. As soon as they were inside, one of them, who looked like a Polish Jew, bolted the door, and then they gathered round me like a pack of hyenas. I backed unostentatiously into the corner by the cellar door, talking valuably to the three men by turn as I went, and the Jew edged along the wall to get behind me, I realized that he was the one whom I had to watch, and I watched him, not looking at him, but keeping him on the periphery of my field of vision. For, as it is well known, the peripheral area of the retina, although insensitive to impressions of form, is highly sensitive to impressions of movement. My remarks on the danger to respectable persons of meddling with stolen property gave Mr. Bamber his cue. "'Stolen property!' he roared. "'Who said anything about stolen property? What do you mean?' "'Your bloomin' scalp-scraper!' And he advanced threateningly, with his chin stuck forward, and a most formidable scowl. In the next few moments I reaped the reward of my strenuous practice at the gymnasium of the art of jiu-jitsu and the French style of boxing. Bamber's advance was the signal. I had seen the Jew's hand steal under his coat-skirt. He now made a quick movement, and so did I. Whisking round, in an instant I had his wrist in that kind of grip that dislocates the elbow-joint, and, as I turned, I planted my foot heavily on Spotty Bamber's chest. The swift movement took them all by surprise. The Jew screamed and then dropped his knife, staggering heavily against the cellar door, which swung back on its well-oiled hinges. Bamber flew backwards like a football, and, as he cannoned against the third man, the two crashed together to the floor. I thrust the Jew through the open doorway, released his wrist, and then followed a slithering sound from the cellar steps, ending in a soft thump. The position was marvellously changed in those few moments. The Jew, I took it, was eliminated, and the odds thus brought back down to a reasonable figure. As to the other two, though they scrambled to their feet quickly enough, they kept their distance, Bamber, in particular, having some little difficulty with his breath. I picked up the concussor and faced them. If I had been quick, I could have dispatched them both without difficulty, but I did not. Once more I was aware of that singular state of consciousness to which I have elsewhere alluded as possessing me in the presence of violent criminals, a vivid pleasure in the mere act of physical contest, perfectly incomprehensible to me in my normal state of mind. This strange joy now sent the blood surging through my brain until my ears hummed, and yet I kept my judgment, calmly attentive and even wary. Thus, when the third ruffian rushed at me with a large sheathed knife, I knocked his hand aside quite neatly with the concussor, and drove him out of range with a heavy blow of my left fist. But at this moment I observed Bamber frantically lugging something from his hip-pocket, something that was certainly not a knife. 
It was time for a change of tactics. Before the third rascal could close with me again, I darted at the open doorway, grasping the rope, and in an instant had swung myself clear of the steps down into the darkness of the cellar. In swinging I had turned half round, and, as I alighted, I saw my aggressor, knife in hand, come through the doorway in pursuit. He had more courage than Spotty, but less discretion. In the haste of his pursuit he actually sprang over the sill onto the slippery top step, and the next moment was bumping down the stairs like an overturned sack of potatoes. As he picked himself up, half stunned, from the prostrate Jew, on whom he had fallen, I regretfully felled him with the concussor. It was a dull finish to the affair, but there was Bamber's revolver to be reckoned with. To do Mr. Bamber justice, he was not rash. In fact, he was so unobtrusive that I began to fear that he had made off, and, it being obviously unsafe to go up and ascertain, I proceeded to make a few encouraging demonstrations. "'Oh!' I shouted. "'Let me go! Let go my hands, or I'll call for the police!' This appeal had the desired effect. The dimly lighted doorway framed the figure of Spotty Bamber, with revolver poised, peering cautiously into the darkness. I renewed my protests, and, retiring to the darkest corner, shuffled noisily about the brick floor. "'Ave yer got him, Alf?' inquired the discreet Bamber, leaning forward and stepping over the sill. I continued to dance heavily in my corner, and to other breathless snorts and exclamations such as, "'Let go, I tell you!' "'Aha, would you?' and so forth. Bamber took another step forward, craned his neck, and called out, "'Shove him over this way, Alf, so as I can—' He did not finish the sentence. Watching him, I saw his feet suddenly fly from under him, the revolver clatter on the cellar floor, and Spotty, himself having slipped halfway down the steps, fell over the edge onto the hard brick pavement. As he picked himself up, breathing heavily, I dropped the concussor into the big pocket of my apron and pounced on him. He uttered a yell of terror, and began to struggle like a maniac to free himself from my grip, while I edged him away from the dangerous vicinity of the revolver. At first he was disposed to show a good deal of fight, and, as we gyrated round the cellar, tugging, thrusting, wrenching, and kicking, I found the strenuous muscular exercise strangely exhilarating. Evidently there is something to be said for the simple life, as lived in those primitive communities where every man is his own policeman." But this physically stimulating bout came to a sudden end. Our mazy revolutions brought us presently near the foot of the steps, and here Spotty tripped over the prostrate form of the third man. He staggered back a few paces, and uttered a husky shriek. And then we came down together on top of the Jew. That finished him. The contact with these two motionless shapes shattered his nerves utterly, and reduced him to sheer panic. He ceased to fight, and only whimpered for mercy. It was very unpleasant. As long as the fight was hot and strenuous, the revived instincts of long-forgotten primitive ancestors kept my blood racing. But, with the first cry for mercy, all my exhilaration died out, and the degenerate emotions of civilized man began to make themselves felt. If I hesitated, I was lost. At every pitiful bleat I felt myself weakening. There was only one thing to do, and I did it, with the concussor. Verbal description is a slow affair compared with action. The whole set of events that I have narrated occupied but a few minutes. When I unbolted the parlour door, and found a somnolent Navi waiting to be shaved, I realised with astonishment how brief the interlude had been. "'Hope I haven't kept you waiting,' I said, anxious to learn if he had heard anything unusual. "'No,' he replied. "'I've only just come in. Didn't expect to find you open.' He seated himself in the chair, and I lathered him profusely with luxurious pleasure in handling the clean soapsuds. The folly of my late visitors in leaving the shop-door unfastened surprised me, and illustrated afresh the poverty of the criminal intelligence. They had assumed that it would all be over in a moment, and had taken no precautions against the improbable. And such is the habitual with whom the costly machinery of the law is unable to cope. Verily there must be a good many fools besides the dishonest ones. I shut up the shop when my customer departed, indulged in a good wash and a substantial supper, for there was much to be done before I could go to bed. I had providently laid in six casks, of a suitable size, of which two were put together and the remainder in the form of loose staves and hoops. One of these would have to be made up at once, since it was necessary that the specimens should be packed before rigor mortis set in, and rendered them unmanageable. Accordingly, I fell to work after supper with the mallet and the broad chisel-like tool with which the hoops are driven in, and did not pause until the bundle of staves was converted into a cask, complete save for the top hoop and head. I proceeded systematically. Into one cask I poured a quart of water, 
and wetted the interior thoroughly to make the wood swell and secure tight joints. Then into it I introduced the Jew, in a sitting posture, and was gratified to find that the specimen occupied the space comfortably. But here a slight difficulty presented itself. The center of gravity in a cask filled with homogeneous matter coincides with the geometrical center. But in a cask containing a deceased Jew, the center of gravity would be markedly eccentric. Such a cask would not roll evenly, and irregular rolling might lead to investigation. However, the remedy was quite simple. My predecessor had been accustomed to cover the floor of the shop with sawdust, and the peculiar habits of my customers had led me to continue the practice. An immense bin of the material occupied a corner of the cellar, and furnished the means of imparting a fictitious homogeneity to the contents of the cask. I shoveled in a quantity around the specimen, headed up the cask, and finished filling it through the bunghole. When I had driven in the bung, I gave the cask a trial roll on the cellar floor, and found that it moved without noticeable irregularity. It was past midnight before I had finished my labors, and had the three casks ready for removal. After another good wash, I went to bed, and, thanks to the invigorating physical exercise, had an excellent night. The following day being Sunday, there was a regrettable delay, since it would have been unwise to challenge attention by trundling the casks through the street when all the world was resting. However, I called at my Bloomsbury house, instructed the sergeant-major that some packages might be delivered on the following day, and, I added, that I should probably be working in the laboratory to-morrow, so if you hear me moving about you will know that it is all right. The sergeant-major touched his cap. He always wore a cap indoors, without speaking. He was the most taciturn and incurious man that I have ever met. When I had taken a look round the laboratory, and made a few preparations, I departed, going out by the museum entrance. It was as well to get the sergeant-major used to these casual, unannounced appearances and disappearances. I walked slowly back to Whitechapel, turning over my plans for the removal of the casks. At first I had thought of taking them to Pickford's receiving office, but there was danger in this, though it was a remote danger. If one of the casks should be accidentally dropped, it would most certainly burst, and then I had no particular objection to being killed, but I had a very great objection to being sent to Broadmoor. So I decided to effect the removal myself, and with the aid of the builder's truck that I had allowed the owner to keep in my yard. But this plan involved the adoption of some sort of disguise, a very slight one would be sufficient, as it was merely to prevent recognition by casual strangers. Now, among the stock of my predecessor, Polensky, I had found a collection of powder colors, grease paint, toupee paste, spirit gum, and other materials which threw a curious light on his activities. On my return to the shop I made a few experiments with these materials, and was astonished to find on what trivial peculiarities facial expression depends. For instance, I discovered that a strip of court plaster, carried tightly up the middle of the forehead, where it would be hidden by a hat, altered the angle of the eyebrows and completely changed the expression, and that a thin scrumble of purple, rubbed on the nose, totally altered the character of the face. This was deeply interesting, and, as it finally disposed of one difficulty, it left me free to consider the rest of my plans, which I continued to do until every possible emergency was anticipated and provided for. Early on Monday morning I went out and purchased four lengths of stout quartering, two long and two short, a coil of rope, and two block of tackle of the kind known to mariners as Handy Billy, and a pair of cask grips. With the quartering and some lengths of rope I made two cask slides, one long for the cellar and a short one for the handcart. Placing the long side in position, I greased it with cart grease, hooked up the tackle above the upper end, attached the grips, and very soon had the three casks hoisted up into the passage that opened into the back yard. With the aid of the short slide and the tackle, I ran them up into the cart, lashed them firmly in position with the stout rope, threw in the slide and tackle, and was ready to start. Running into the shop, I fixed the necessary strip of court plaster on my forehead, tinted my nose, and, having pocketed the stick of paint, and a piece of plaster, put on my shabbiest overcoat and neckcloth, trod on my hat and jammed it on my head so that it should cover the strip of plaster. Then I went out, trundling the cart into the alley, locked the back gate, and set forth on my journey. Navigating the crowded streets with a heavy cart clattering behind me, I made my way westward, avoiding the main thoroughfares with their bewildering traffic, until I found myself in Theobad's Row, at the end of Red Lion Street. Here I began to look about for a likely deputy, and presently my eye lighted on a sturdy-looking man who leaned somewhat dejectedly against the post, and sucked at an empty pipe. He was evidently not a regular corner-boy, 
I judged him to be a laborer out of work, and deciding that he would serve my purpose, I addressed him. "'Want a job, mate?' He roused at once. "'You've it it, mate, I do. What sort of job?' "'Pull this truck round to 6A, Pimsbury Street, and deliver the tubs.' "'How much will you give me?' was the inevitable inquiry. "'Old chap will give you half a crown if you ask him. And how much am I to keep?' "'Oh, we won't quarrel about that. I've got to see to another job, or I'd take em myself. You deliver the tubs, and be careful of em. They're full of valuable chemicals. And meet me here at ten o'clock, and I'll give you another job. Will that do you?' My friend pocketed his pipe and spat on his hands. "'Give me the bloomin' truck,' he said, and when I had surrendered the pole to him, he set off at a pace that made me thankful for the stout rope lashings of the casks. I let him draw ahead, and then followed at a discreet distance, keeping him in sight until he was within a few hundred yards of my house. Then I darted down a side turning, took a short cut across a square, and, arriving at the museum entrance, let myself in with my Yale key. To remove my hat, overcoat, and coat, to tear off the plaster and wash my nose, was but the work of a minute. I had placed in readiness my laboratory apron, a velvet skull-cap, and a pair of spectacles, and scarcely had I assumed these and settled my eyebrows into a studious frown when the bell rang. A glance into a little mirror that hung on the wall satisfied me as to the radical change in my appearance, and I went out confidently and opened the street door. My deputy was standing on this doorstep and touched his cap nervously as he met my portentous frown. "'These here barrels for you, sir?' he asked. "'Quite right,' I replied in deep, pompous tones. "'I will help you to bring them in.' We brought the cart up on the pavement with the pole across the threshold, and I fixed the slide in position, while my assistant cast off the lashings. In a couple of minutes we had run the casks down the slide, and I had the satisfaction of seeing them safely deposited in the hall. The dangers and difficulties of the passage were at an end. I handed my proxy the half-crown, which he sheepishly demanded, with an extra shilling, for a glass of beer, and saw him go on his way rejoicing. Then I went back to the laboratory stuck on a fresh strip of plaster, rubbed on a tint of grease-paint, and resumed my disreputable garments. When I came forth into the street, the hand-cart had already disappeared, leaving me to pursue my way unobserved to the rendezvous, where I presently met my friend, and, having rejoiced with him a further shilling, resumed possession of the cart. On my arrival at my Whitechapel premises, I fixed a notice to the window informing the nobility and gentry that I was absent on business. Then I clothed myself decently, emptied the contents of the safe into a handbag, into which I also put the cooper's chisel, locked up the premises, and hurried off to Aldgate Station. My first objective was the establishment of Mr. Hammerstein, the dealer in osteology, from whom I purchased three articulated human skeletons, and obtained the invaluable receipted invoices, and having thus taken every precaution that prudence and human foresight could suggest, I repaired to my Bloomsbury house, let myself in at the museum door, rolled the casks through into the laboratory, and proceeded to unpack the specimens. The initial processes occupied me far into the night, while, as to the finishing operations, they kept me busy for over a month, during which time I shaved and cut hair throughout the day, up to nine o'clock at night, reserving the laboratory work for a relaxation after the prosaic labors of the day. Looked at broadly, the episode was highly satisfactory and successful, excepting in one vital respect. None of the three specimens had ringed hair. The completed preparations were, after all, the by-products of my industry. The wretch whom I sought was still at large and unidentified. My collection still lacked its crowning ornament. End of chapter 5one of the uttermost farthing. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. The Uttermost Farthing by R. Austin Freeman. Chapter 6. The Trail of the Serpent. Part 1. Hitherto, in my transcriptions from Humphrey Challoner's Museum Archives, I have taken the entries in their order, omitting only such technical details as might seem unsuitable for the lay reader. Now, however, I pass over a number of entries. The capture of numbers 7, 8, and 9 exhibit the methods to which Challoner, in the main, adhered during his long residence in East London, and, though there were occasional variations, the accounts of the captures present a general similarity which might render their recitals tedious. The last entry but one, on the other hand, is among the most curious and interesting. Apart from the stirring incidents that it records, the new light that it throws on a hitherto unsolved mystery 
makes it worth exacting entire, which I now proceed to do, with the necessary omissions alluded to above. Circumstances connected with the acquirement of numbers 23 and 24 in the anthropological series. The sand of my life ran out with varying speed, as it seemed to me, in the little barber's shop in Saul Street, Whitechapel. Now would my pulses beat and the current of my blood run swift. Those were the times when I had visitors, and presently a new skeleton or two would make their appearance in the long wall case. But there were long intervals of sordid labor and dull inaction, when I would cut hair, and examine it through my lens, day after day, and wonder whether, in electing to live, rather than pass voluntarily into eternal repose, I had, after all, chosen the better part. For in all those years no customer with ringed hair ever came to my shop. The long pursuit seemed to bring me no nearer to that unknown wretch, the slayer of my beloved wife. Still was he hidden from me amidst the unclean multitude that seethed around. Or perchance some sort of grave had already offered him an everlasting sanctuary, leaving me weary to pursue a phantom enemy. But I am digressing. This is not a record of my emotions, but a history of the contents of my museum. Let me proceed to specimens twenty-three and twenty-four, and the very remarkable circumstances under which I had the good fortune to acquire them. First, however, I must describe an incident which, although it occurred some time before, never developed its importance until this occasion arose. One drowsy afternoon there came to my shop a smallish, shabby-looking man. Quiet and civil in manner, and particularly wooden as to his countenance. In short, a typical old lag. I recognized the type at a glance. The penal servitude face had become a familiar phenomenon. He spread himself out to be shaved, and to have the severely official style of his coiffure replaced by a less distinctive mode. And as I worked, he conversed affably. Saw old Polensky a week or two ago. Did you indeed? said I. Yes. Portland. Got into hot water, too, he did. "'Tried to fetch the farm, and didn't pull it off. "'The farm, I may explain, is the prison infirmary. "'Got dropped on for malingering. "'That's the way with these bloomin' foreigners.' "'He didn't impose on the doctor, then?' "'Lord, no. "'Doctor'd seen that sort of bloke before. "'Polensky said he'd got a pain in his stomach, "'so the doctor says it must be because his diet was too rich, "'and knocks off arf his grub. "'I tell yer, Polensky was sorry he'd spoke.' Here, my client, showing a disposition to smile, I removed the razor to allow him to do so. Presently he resumed, discursively. I knew this house years ago, before Polensky's time, when old Durdler had it. Durdler used to do the smashing lay-up on the second floor, and me and two or three nippers used to work for him, plantin' the snide, you know. He was a rare Lyrian, was Durdler. It was him what made that sliding door in the wall in the second floor front. I picked up my ears at this. A sliding door? In this house? Goblimey! exclaimed my client. Meter say you don't know about that door? I assured him most positively that I had never heard of it. Well, well, he muttered. Sitch a useful thing, too. Durdler used to keep his molds and stuff up there, and then, when there was a scare of the cops, he used to pop the thing through into the next house. Mrs. Jacob had a room next door and the coppers used to come and sniff around, but of course there wasn't nothing to see. Regular suck-in for them. And it was useful if you was follered. You could mizzle in through the shop, run upstairs, pop through the door, downstairs next door, and out through the back yard. I've done it myself. Who's got the second floor front now? I have, said I. I kept the whole of the house. My eye, exclaimed my friend, whose name I learned to be Towler. You are bloomin' toff. "'Like me to show you that door?' I said that I should like it very much, and accordingly, when the trimming operations were concluded and I had secured a wisp of Mr. Trollow's hair for subsequent examination, we ascended to the second-floor front, and he demonstrated the hidden door. "'It's in this ear cupboard, under that row of pegs. That peg underneath at the side is the andle. You catch his old of it, so, and you gives it a pull to the right.' He suited the action to the words, and, with a loud groan, the middle third of the back of the cupboard slid bodily to the right, leaving an opening about three feet square, beyond which was a solid-looking panel with a small knob at the left-hand side. That, whispered Towler, is the back of a cupboard in the next house. If you was to pull that handle to the right, it would slide along same as this one, only I expect there's somebody in the room there. 
I rewarded Mr. Towler with a half-sovereign, which he evidently thought liberal, and he departed gleefully. Shortly afterwards I learned that he had got a stretch, in connection with a job at Camberwell, and he vanished from my ken. But I did not forget the sliding doors. No special use for them suggested itself, but their potentialities were so obvious that I resolved to keep a sharp eye on the second-floor front next door. I had not long to wait. Presently the whole floor was advertised by a card on the street door as being to let, and I seized the opportunity of a quiet Sunday to reconnoitre and put the arrangements in going order. I slid back the panel on my side, and then, dragging at the handle, pushed back the second panel. Both moved noisily, and would require careful treatment. I passed through the second opening into the vacant room, and looked around. But there was little to see, though a good deal to smell, for the windows were hermeneutically sealed, and a closed stove fitted into the fireplace to preclude any possibility of ventilation. The aroma of the late tenants still lingered in the air. I returned through the opening and began my labors. First, with a hard brush, I cleaned out both sets of grooves, top and bottom. Then, into each groove I painted a thick coating of tallow and black lead, mixed into a paste and heated. By moving the panels backwards and forwards a great number of times, I distributed the lubricant and brought the black lead to such a polish that the door slid with the greatest ease and without a sound. I was so pleased with the result that I was tempted to engage the room next door, but as this might have aroused suspicion, seeing that I had a whole house already, I refrained, and shortly afterwards the floor was taken by a family of Polish Jews, who apparently supplemented their income by letting a part of it furnished. I now pass over an intervening period and come to the circumstances of one of my most interesting and stirring experiences. It was about this time that some misbegotten mechanician invented the automatic magazine pistol, and thereby rendered possible a new and execrable type of criminal. It was not long before the appropriate criminal arrived. The scene of the first appearance was in the suburb of Trottenham, where two Russian Poles attempted, and failed in, an idiotic street robbery. The attempt was made in broad daylight in the open street, and the two wretches, having failed, ran away, shooting at every human being they met. In the end they were both killed, one by his own hand, but not until they had murdered a gallant constable and a poor little child, and injured in all twenty-two persons. I read the newspaper account with deep interest, and the conviction that this was only a beginning. These two frenzied degenerates belonged to a common enough type, the type of the Slav criminal, who has not sense enough to take precautions, nor courage enough to abide the fortune of war. The automatic pistol, I felt sure, would bring him into view, and I was not mistaken. One night, returning from a tour of inspection, I met a small, excited crowd accompanying a procession of three police ambulances. I joined the throng, and presently turned into a small, blind thoroughfare, in which had gathered a small and nervous-looking crowd, and a few flurried policemen. Several of the windows were shattered, and on the ground were three prostrate figures. One was dead, the others were badly wounded, and all three were members of the police force. I watched the ambulances depart with their melancholy burdens, and then turned for information to a bystander. He had not much to give, but the substance of his account, confirmed later by the newspapers, was this. The police had located a gang of suspected burglars, and three officers had come to the house to make arrests. They had knocked at the door, which, after some delay, was opened. Some person within had immediately shot one of the officers dead, and the entire gang of four or five had rushed out, fired point-blank at the other two officers, and then raced up the street shooting right and left like madmen. Several people had been wounded, and, grievous to relate, the whole gang of miscreants had made their escape into the surrounding slums. I was profoundly interested, and even excited, for several reasons. In the first place, here at last was the real Lombroso criminal. The subhuman matoid, devoid of intelligence, devoid of the faintest glimmering of a moral sense, fit for nothing but the lethal chamber, compared with whom the British habitual was a civilized gentleman. Without a specimen or two of this type, my collection was incomplete. Then there was the evident applicability of my methods to this class of offender, methods of quiet extermination without fuss, public disorder, or risk to the precious lives of the police. But beyond these there was another reason for my interest. The murder of my wife had been a purposeless, unnecessary crime, committed by some wretch to whom human life was a thing of no consideration. There was an analogy in the circumstances that seemed to connect that murder with this type of miscreant. It was even possible that one of these villains, 
might be the one whom I had so patiently sought through the long and weary years. The thought fired me with new enthusiasm. Forthwith, I started to pursue the possible course of the fugitives, threading countless by-streets and alleys, peering into squalid courts, and sending many a doubtful-looking loiterer shuffling hastily round the nearest corner. Of course it was fruitless. I had no clue, and did not even know the men. I was merely walking off my own excitement. Nevertheless, every night as soon as I had closed my shop, I set forth on a voyage of exploration, impelled by sheer restlessness, and during the day I listened eagerly to the talk of my customers in Yiddish, a language of which I was supposed to be entirely ignorant. But I learned nothing. Either the fugitives were unknown, or the natural secretiveness of an alien people forbade any reference to them, even among themselves. And meanwhile, as I have said, I tramped the streets nightly into the small hours of the morning. Returning from one of these expeditions a little earlier than usual, I found a small party of policemen and a sprinkling of idlers gathered opposite the house next door. There was no need to ask what was doing. The suppressed excitement of the officers and the service revolvers in their belts told the story. There was going to be another slaughter, and I was probably too late for any but a spectator's part. The street door was open, and the house was being quietly emptied of its human occupants. They came out one by one, shivering and complaining, with little bundles of their possessions hastily snatched up, and collected in a miserable group on the pavement. I opened my shop door and invited them to come in and rest while their messengers went to look for a harbor of refuge, but I stayed outside to see the upshot of the proceedings. When the last of the tenants had come out, a sergeant emerged and quietly closed the street door with a latch key. The rest of the policemen took up sheltered positions in doorways after warning the idlers to disperse, and the sergeant turned to me. "'Now, Mr. Vosper, you'd better keep your nose indoors if you don't want it shot off. There's going to be trouble presently.' He pushed me gently into the shop and shut the door after me. I found the evicted tenants chattering excitedly and very unhappy, but they were not rebellious. They were mostly Jews, and Jews are patient, submissive people. I boiled some water in my little copper, which they drank gratefully, out of shaving mugs, my outfit of crockery being otherwise rather limited, and meanwhile they talked volubly, and I listened. "'I wonder,' said a stout elderly Jewess, "'how der police know those gentlemen's got to lodge mit me. Somebody must have told them.' "'Yes,' agreed an evicted tenant of doubtful occupation. "'Some bloomin' nark is givin' em away. Good job, too.' "'Tain't playin' the game for to go pottin' at coppers like that there. "'Coppers has got their job to do same as we have. "'You know that, Mrs. Kaminsky.' "'Ya, yeah, dat is true,' said the Jewess. "'But they might let me bring my things mit me. "'Dumorrow is Kai Fox Day. "'Now I lose my money.' "'How is that, Mrs. Kaminsky?' I asked. "'Because I sell them not, de things I buy for Kai Fox Day. "'De fireworks, de grangers, de mags, and other things for de children's. Twenty five shillings for I buy. They are in my room on the second floor. I ask the police to let me fetch them. Hot they say no. I shall disturb the gentlemen's in the front room. So I lose my money because I sell them not. Here the unfortunate woman burst into tears, and I was so much affected by her distress that I instantly offered to buy the whole consignment for two pounds. Whereat she wept more copiously than ever, but collected the purchase money with great promptitude and stowed it away in a very internal pocket displaying in the process as many layers of clothing as an old-fashioned pen-wiper. "'Ach, Mr. Fosper, you are so good to all de poor beebles, though you are only a poor man yourself. But it is de poor, but is de friends o' de poor, and in her gratitude she would have kissed my hands if I had not prudently stuck them into my trouser-pockets. A messenger now arrived to say that a refuge had been secured for the night, and my guest departed with many thanks and benedictions. The street, as I looked out, was now quite deserted, save for one or two prowling policemen who, apparently, bored with their hiding-places, had come forth to patrol in the open. I did not stay to watch them, for Mrs. Kosminsky's remarks had started a train of thought which required to be carried out quickly. Accordingly, I went in and fell to pacing the empty shop. The police, I assumed, were waiting for daylight to rush the house. It was a mad plan, and yet I was convinced that they had no other— and when they should enter, in the face of a stream of bullets from those terrible automatic pistols, what a carnage there would be! It was frightful to think of. Why does the law permit those cowards' tools to be made and sold? A pistol is the one weapon that has no legitimate use. 
An axe, a knife, even a rifle has some lawful function, but a pistol is an appliance for killing human beings. It has no other purpose whatever. A man who is found with housebreaking tools in his possession is assumed to be a housebreaker. Surely a man who carries a pistol convicts himself of the intention to kill somebody. But perhaps the police had some reasonable plan. It was possible, but it was very unlikely. The British policeman is a grand fellow, brave as a lion and ready to march cheerfully into the mouth of hell if duty calls, but he knows no tactics. His very courage is almost a disadvantage, leading him to disdain reasonable caution. I felt that our guardians were again going to sacrifice themselves to these vermin. It was terrible. It was a wicked waste of precious lives. Could nothing be done to prevent it? According to Mrs. Kaminsky, the gentlemen's were in the second-floor front, the room with the sliding panel. Then I could, at least, keep a watch on them. I walked slowly upstairs, gnashing my teeth with irritation. The sacrifice was so unnecessary. I could think, off-hand, of half a dozen ways of annihilating those wretches, without risking a single hair of any decent person's head. And here were the police, with all the resources of science at their disposal, and practically unlimited time in which to work, actually contemplating a fight with the odds against them. I stole into the second-floor front and, by the light of a match, found the cupboard. The inside panel, as I will call the one on my side, slid back without a sound. There was now only the second panel between me and the next room. I could plainly hear the murmur of voices and sounds of movement, but I could not distinguish what was being said, and as this was of some importance I determined to try the other panel. Grasping the handle, I gave a firm but gradual pull, and felt the panel slide back quite silently for a couple of inches. Instantly the voices became perfectly distinct, and a whiff of foul, stuffy air came through, with a faint glimmer of light, by which I knew that the cupboard on their side was at least partly open. "'I tell you, Pirogov, said a voice in Russian, "'you are nervous about nothing. The police are looking for us, but they know none of us by sight. We can go about quite safely.' "'I'm not so sure,' replied another voice, presumably Pirogov's. "'The babbling fool who led us the house may talk more, and who knows but some of our own people may betray us. That woman Kosminsky looked very queerly at us, I thought.' "'Bah!' exclaimed the other. "'Come and lie down, Pirogov. Tomorrow we will leave this place and separate. We shall go away for a time, and they will forget us. Put some more coke in the stove and let us go to sleep. How incalculable are the groupings of factors that evolve the causation of events!' Those last words of the invisible ruffian seemed quite trivial and inconsequent, and yet they framed his death warrant. I did not myself realize it fully at the moment. As I closed the slide and stepped back, I was conscious only that a useful train of thought had been started. Put some more coke in the stove and let us go to sleep. Yes, there was a clear connection between the idea of stove and that of sleep, a sleep of infinite duration. Therein lay the solution of the problem. I walked slowly down the stairs, tracing the connection between the ideas of stove and sleep. The nauseous air that had filtered through from that room spoke eloquently of sealed windows and stopped crevices. It was a frosty night, and the murderers were chilly. A back draught in the stove-pipe would fill the room with poisonous gases and probably suffocate those wretches slowly and quietly. But how was it to be brought about? For a moment I thought of climbing to the roof and stopping the chimney from above, but the plan was a bad one. The police might see me, and make some regrettable mistake with a revolver. Besides, it would probably fail. The stoppage of the draught would extinguish the fire, and the pungent coke fumes would warn the villains of their danger. Still closely pursuing the train of thought, I stepped into my bedroom and lit the gas. I turned to glance around the room, and behold, the problem was solved. In the fireplace stood a small brass stove of Russian make, a tiny affair, too small to burn anything but charcoal, but— as charcoal was easily obtainable in East London, I had bought it and fixed it myself. It was perfectly safe in a well-ventilated room, though otherwise very dangerous, for fumes of charcoal, consisting of nearly pure carbon dioxide, being practically inodorous, give no warning. My course was now quite clear. The stove was fitted with asbestos-covered handles, a box of charcoal stood by the hearth, and in the corner was an extra length of stove-pipe, for which I had had no use. But I had a use for it now. I lit the charcoal in the stove, and, while it was burning up, carried the stove-pipe and the box of fuel upstairs. Then I returned for the stove, inside which the charcoal was now beginning to glow brightly. I fixed on the extra length of pipe and, with my hand, felt the stream of hot air, 
or rather hot carbon dioxide gas, pouring out of its mouth. I tried the pipe against the opening, and found that it would rest comfortably on the lower edge, and then, very slowly and cautiously, I drew back the sliding panel about six inches. The ruffians were still wrangling on the same subject, for I heard one exclaim, "'Don't be a fool, Piragoff. You'll only attract attention if you go nosing about downstairs.' "'I don't care,' was the answer. "'I feel uneasy. I must go down and see if all is quiet before I go to sleep.' Here the sound of the opening and shutting of the door put an end to the discussion, save for a torrent of curses and maledictions from the two remaining men. But in a few moments the door opened noisily, and Piragoff shouted, "'Come out! Come out! The house is empty! We are betrayed!' A howl of dismay was the answer. The two wretches burst into a grotesque mixture of weeping and cursing, and I heard them literally dancing about the room in the ecstasy of their terror. "'Come out!' repeated Piragoff. "'We will kill them all. We will shoot those pigs, every one of them. Some of us shall get away. Come!' "'It's of no use, Piragoff. whimpered one of his comrades. "'They are in the house. It is an ambush.' "'Yes,' cried the third man. "'It is as Boris says.' The house is dark, and they are hiding in it. Bolt the door, and let them come to us, and we will kill them. Kill! 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 He ended with an unearthly shriek and a burst of hysterical sobs. "'I shall go,' said Birgoff. "'There's a chance.' "'There is none,' shrieked the other. "'Come back, madman!' The door slammed, the key turned in the lock, and a heavy bolt was shot. I quietly closed the slide and ran down to the open window of the first-floor front room. The street appeared to be empty save for two constables who stood at a corner conversing in low tones. A profound silence reigned, an unusual silence, it seemed, through which the subdued murmur of the constables' voices was faintly audible. I looked out anxiously, debating whether I ought not to warn the unconscious sentinels, even at the risk of defeating my plans. Suddenly two sharp reports in quick succession rang out from below. Both constables fell, and a figure darted out of the doorway and raced madly up the street. One of the fallen constables lay motionless. The other grasped his hip with one hand, and with the other fired his revolver repeatedly at the retreating murderer, but apparently missed him every time. In a few seconds a sergeant and another constable came flying round the corner. Police whistles began to sound their warning in all directions, and the previous silence gave place to a very babble of noise but Piragoff had shot up a side turning before the sergeant arrived, and the persistent clamor of the whistles told me that he had, for the moment at least, escaped. I turned away. Piragoff was out of my hands, and what I had seen only made it more imperative that I should prevent further bloodshed. As, once more, I softly opened the slide, the voices of the miserable wretches within came to me in a strange and unpleasant mixture of curses, blasphemies, and hysterical sobs. They cursed Piragoff, they cursed the police, they invoked death and destruction on every man, woman, and child in this nation of pigs, and between the curses they wept and lamented. I had shut the damper of the stove before going down, but the charcoal was still alight, though dull. I now arranged the stove in position, resting the long pipe on the bottom edge of the opening, so that its end projected a few inches into the room, moving quite silently, and assisted by the hubbub from without and the noise produced by the two craven villains. When it was fixed, I opened the damper, and presently, holding my hand opposite the mouth of the pipe, felt a strong current of hot gas pouring out. That gas would cool rapidly on meeting the cold air, and would then fall by its own weight and collect about the floor. My apparatus was now in full going order, and there was nothing for it but to wait. The noise in the street had subsided, but the two ruffians showed no signs of settling down. They were now engaged in barricading the door so that it could be forced open only a few inches, thus exposing the attackers to a deadly fire. I was much obliged to them. Their movements would help to diffuse the gas, and prevent it from settling too densely on the floor. Also, their exertions would make them breathe more deeply, and so come more rapidly under the influence of the poison. The time crept on. The police made no sign. The murderers rested from their labors sometimes talking excitedly, sometimes silent for a few minutes at a time, and at intervals yawning like overstrung women. And all the time the invisible stream of heavy, deadly gas was pouring out of the stovepipe and trickling unseen along the floor. Even now it must be eddying about the murderer's feet and slowly diffusing upwards. 
If only the police would remain quiescent for an hour or two more, the danger would be over. The long hours of the winter's night dragged out their weary length, yet not weary to me, for, as I kept my vigil by the pipe and fed the stove silently at intervals, I was on the very tiptoe of expectation. Every moment I dreaded to hear the disastrous crash on the door that should herald a fresh slaughter, and, as the minutes passed and all remained still, hope rose higher and higher. Sometimes I caught a glimpse of my quarry, through the chink of their cupboard door, for I had opened the slide fully a foot, finding that the clothes that hung from the pegs would screen me, even if the darkness on my side had not done so already. So I saw one of them sit down on a low chair and couch, shuddering over the coke stove, while the other restlessly paced the room, and still the stream of deadly gas trickled unceasingly from the pipe. Presently the former rose and yawned heavily. Bah! he growled. I am tired. I shall lie down. If I fall asleep, Boris, do you watch and wake me if you hear them coming. By craning my neck through the opening, I could just continue to get a glimpse of him as he threw himself on a mattress that was spread on the floor. The other man continued for a while to pace the room. Then he sat down on the chair and spread his hands out over the stove, muttering to himself. I watched him as well as I could through the chink of the cupboard doors, by the dim light of the stinking paraffin lamp a greasy, unwholesome-looking wretch, sallow, pallid, and unshorn, and thought how striking he would look in the form of a reduced, dry preparation. But that was impossible. I was now working only for the police. Regrettable as it was, I should have to surrender these two specimens to the coroner and the grave-digger. A deplorable waste of material, but unavoidable, even if one of them should prove to be my long-sought enemy. At this thought I started, and— at that moment the man on the mattress gave a strange, snorting cry. The ruffian, Boris, looked round, rose, went over to the mattress, and stirred the other with his foot. "'Louis! Louis!' he cried angrily. "'What the devil are you making that noise for?' The other man scrambled up with a cry of terror, pistol in hand. "'Ah, it is you, Boris. I was dreaming. I thought they had come.' He sat down again on the mattress and yawned. "'Bah! I am sleepy.' I must lie down again. Watch a little longer, Boris. Why should I watch? demanded Boris. They will make enough noise opening the door. I shall lie down a little, too. He flung himself down beside his comrade, but in a minute or two started up, taking deep breaths. My God! he exclaimed. I can't breathe lying down. I feel as if I should choke. And you, too, Louis. You are snorting like a pig. Get up, man. He shook the prostrate man roughly, but eliciting only a few drowsy curses, resumed his restless pacing of the room, but not for long. Yawn after yawn told me that the gas was already in his blood, and the loud snoring of the other man indicated plainly the state of the air in the lower part of the room. Presently Boris halted in his walk and sat down by the stove, muttering as before. Soon he began to nod. Then he nearly fell forward on the stove. Finally he rose heavily, staggered across to the mattress, and once more flung himself down. End of chapter 6, part 1of the uttermost farthing this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne the uttermost farthing by r austin freeman chapter six the trail of the serpent part two i breathed more freely notwithstanding that the gas having partially diffused upwards to the level of the opening now began to filter through to my side i waited a minute or two listening to the breathing of the two murderers as it grew moment by moment more stenorious and irregular and then having filled up the stove, went down to the first floor and sat a while by the open window, to breathe the relatively fresh air. All was now quiet in the street. No doubt the guard had been strengthened, but I did not look out. It was as well not to be seen at that hour in the morning. As I sat by the window I thought about the two men in that deadly room. It was a thousand pities that they should be lost to science, yet there was no help for it. Even if I had decided to acquire them, I could not have done so, for— by the very worst of luck, I had used up my last barrel and had neglected to lay in a fresh stock. But, of course, the police knew that they were there. I rested for half an hour or so and then went upstairs to see how matters were progressing. No light now came through the opening in the wall, for the paraffin lamp had either burned out or been extinguished by the accumulating gas. I listened attentively. The harsh, metallic ticking of a cheap American clock was plainly, even intrusively, audible. Otherwise no sound came from that chamber of death. 
I drew the sliding panel right back, held aside the dangling garments, and, climbing through into the cupboard, pushed open the doors. A faint glimmer of light from the street made dimly visible the mattress on the floor and the two indistinct dark shapes stretched out on it. I stepped quickly across the room, breathing as little as possible of the unspeakably foul air, and struck a wax match. It burned dimly and smokily, but showed me the two murderers, lying in easy postures, their faces livid and ghastly in hue, but peaceful enough in expression. When I lowered the match its flame dwindled and turned blue, and at eighteen inches from the floor it went out as if dipped in water. At that height the heavy gas must have been nearly pure. The room was a veritable grotto del cane. I stooped quickly, holding my breath, and felt the wrists of the two men. They were chilly to the touch, and no vestige of pulse was perceptible. I shook them both vigorously, but failed to elicit any responsive movement. They were quite limp and inert, and I had no doubt that they were dead. My work was done. The policemen were now safe, whatever follies they might commit, and it only remained for me to remove the traces of the fairy godmother who had labored through the night to save them from their own exuberant courage. Passing back through the opening, I drew away the now unnecessary pipe, closed the two panels, and carried the little stove down to my bedroom. I looked at the unruffled bed, mute but eloquent witness to the night's activity, and deciding as a measure of prudence to give it the appearance of having been slept in, took off my boots and crept in between the sheets. But I was not in the least degree drowsy. Quite the contrary, I was all agog to see the end of the comedy in which I had, all unknown, taken the leading part, so that after tossing about for a few minutes I sprang out of bed, resumed my boots, and poured out a basin full of water to refresh myself by a wash and now once more observed the strangely indirect lines of causation. The towels on the horse were damp and none too clean. I flung them into the dirty linen basket and dragged open the drawer in which the clean ones were kept. It was the bottom drawer of a cheap pine chest that I had bought in Whitechapel High Street. That chest of drawers was of unusual size. It was four feet wide by nearly five feet high, and the two bottom drawers were each fully eighteen inches deep and were far larger than was necessary for my modest stock of household linen. I pulled out the bottom drawer then, and as its great cavity yawned before me, it offered not an unnatural suggestion. The length of an average man's head and trunk is under thirty-six inches. Allowing a few inches more for his feet and ankles, a cavity forty-eight inches long is amply sufficient for his accommodation. Flinging out the towels and sheets that lay in the drawer, I got in and lay down with my knees drawn up. Of course there was room, and to spare. It was an interesting fact, but not very applicable to the present circumstances. Still, it set me thinking. I went into the front room and glanced out the open window. A faint lightning of the murky sky heralded the approach of dawn, and from afar came the murmuring commencing of traffic out on High Street. I was about to turn away when my ear caught a new and unusual sound rising above that distant murmur. The measured tread of feet mingled with the clatter of horses' hoofs, and a heavy, metallic rumbling. I looked out cautiously in the direction whence the sounds came, and was positively stupefied with amazement. At the end of the street I saw, by the light of the lamps, a company of soldiers appearing round the corner, and taking up a position across the road. I watched breathlessly. Soon, at a sign from the officer, the men spread mats on the muddy ground and lay down on them and then appeared a train of horses, dragging a field-piece or quick-firing gun, which was halted behind the infantry and unlimbered. A minute later the black shapes of a number of soldiers appeared on the skyline as they crept along the parapets of the opposite houses, where, save for their heads and the barrels of their rifles, they presently disappeared. It seems that I had misjudged the police in the matter of caution. It almost seemed that my labors had been useless, for surely these portentous preparations indicated some masterpiece of strategy. What an anticlimax it would be when the defenders of the fort were found to be dead! But what still a greater anticlimax if they were not there at all! At this moment a police sergeant strolled down the middle of the road and, observing me, motioned me with his hand to get inside out of harm's way. I obeyed with grim amusement, thinking of that absurd anticlimax and somehow this idea began to connect itself with those two bottom drawers. But the casks were the difficulty. The cooper from which I had obtained them sometimes kept me waiting nearly a week before supplying them, for I was only a small customer, and that would never do even at this time of year. Besides, the police would make a rigid search. Not that that would have mattered if I could have made proper arrangements for the concealment and removal of the specimens, 
but unfortunately I could not. The specimens would have to go, to be borne out ingloriously in the face of the besieging force, limp and passive, like a couple of those very helpless guys that are wont to be produced by what Mrs. Kosminsky would call their children's. There would be a certain grim appropriateness in the incident, for this was the 5th of November. The generation of new ideas is chiefly a matter of association. The ideas guys, Mrs. Kosminsky, and the 5th of November, unconsciously formed themselves into a group from which in an instant there was evolved a new and startling train of thought. At first it seemed wild enough, but when the two bottom drawers joined in the synthetic process, a complete and consistent scheme began to appear. A flush of pleasurable excitement swept over me, and as I raced upstairs fresh details added themselves, and fresh difficulties were propounded and disposed of. I slid open the panels, stepped through, and, holding my breath, strode across the poisoned room with only one quick glance at the two still forms on the mattress. Removing the barricading chair, I unlocked and unbolted the door and passed out, closing it after me. Mrs. Kosminsky's room was at the back, a dreadful nest of dirt and squalor, piled almost to the ceiling with unclassifiable rubbish. The air was so stifling that I was tempted to raise the heavily curtained window a couple of inches, and thereby got a useful idea when, peeping over the curtain, I saw the flat leads of a projecting lower story. The merchandise piled on all sides, and even under the bed, included very second-hand wearing apparel, sheets, blankets, crockery, and toys. Among them were the fireworks, the masks, and other appliances for commemorating the never-to-be-forgotten gunpowder treason, and a couple of large balls of dark-colored cord, sometimes used by coasters for securing their loads. That gave me an idea, too, as did the frowsily smart female garments. I appropriated four of the largest masks and a quantity of oakum for wigs, some colored paper streamers and hat frills, two huge and disreputable dresses, Mrs. Kosminsky's own, I suspected, the skirts of which I crammed with straw from a hamper, two large-sized ragged suits of clothes, a woman's straw hat, four pairs of men's gloves, and the biggest top hat that I could find. These I put apart in a heap with one of the balls of cord. From the other ball I cut off some eight fathoms of cord, and, poking it out through the opening in the window, let it drop on the leads beneath. Then I conveyed my spoil in one or two journeys across the murderer's room, passed it through the opening, and closed the panel after me. Prudent suggested that I should dispose of these things first, and accordingly I stowed two masks, two pairs of gloves, one suit of clothes, and one dress in the large chest of drawers. The rest I carried down to the back yard, where there was already a quantity of lumber, belonging to a neighboring green grocer. Returning upstairs, I called in at the bedroom to transfer the scanty contents of the two large drawers into the upper ones, and then proceeded once more to the second-floor front. Time was passing, and the glimmer of the gray dawn was beginning to struggle in faintly through the dirty windows. As I drew back the slide I became aware of a sound which, soft as it was, rang the knell of my newly formed hopes. I had closed the door of the murderer's room and locked it, but had not shot the bolt. Now I could distinctly hear someone fumbling gently at the keyhole, apparently with a picklock. It was most infuriating. At the very last moment, when success was within my grasp, I was to be foiled and all my neatly laid plans defeated. And, to make it a thousand times worse, I had not even taken the precaution to examine the dead miscreant's hair. With an angry and foolish exclamation, I reached through the opening and drew the cupboard doors too, leaving only a small chink. Then I shut myself in my own cupboard, to exclude the dim light, and closing the panel to within an inch, waited on events with my hand on the knob, ready to shut it at a moment's notice. The great strategic move was about to begin, and I was curious to see what it would be. The bolt of the lock shot back, the door creaked softly, there was a pause, and then a voice whispered, "'Why, they seem to be asleep. Keep them covered, Smith, and shoot if they move.' Soft footfalls advanced across the room. Someone gave a choking cough, and then a brassy voice fairly shouted, "'Why, man, they're dead! My lord! What a let-off!' An unsteady laugh told of the effort it had cost the worthy officer to take this frightful risk. "'Yes,' said another voice, "'they're dead enough. They've cheated us after all. Not that I complain of that. But my eye, sir, what a sell! Think of all those Tommies and that machine-gun. Ha, ha! Oh, Lord!' I suppose the beggars poisoned themselves when they saw the game was up. He laughed again, and the laugh ended in a fit of coughing. "'Not they, sergeant,' said the other. 
It was that coke stove that gave them their ticket. Can't you smell it? And by Jove, it will give us our ticket if we don't clear out. We'll just run down and report and send for a couple of stretchers. Hadn't I better wait here, sir, while you're gone? asked the sergeant. Lord, no, man. What for? We shall want three stretchers if you do. Come along. Pooh. Leave the door open. I listened incredulously to their retreating footsteps. It seemed hardly possible that they should be so devoid of caution. And yet, why not? The men were dead, and dead men are not addicted to sudden disappearances. But this case was going to be an exception. I had given the specimens up for lost when I heard the police enter, but now... I opened the slide, sprang through the opening, and strove over to the mattress. One after the other I picked up the prostrate ruffians, carried them across, and bundled them through the aperture. Then I came through myself, shut the cupboard doors, closed both panels carefully, shut up my own cupboard, and carried the specimens down to my bedroom. With their knees drawn up, they packed quite easily in the large drawers. I shut them in, locked the drawers, pocketed the key, washed my hands, and went down to the parlor where I rapidly laid the breakfast table. At any moment now the police might come to inspect, and whenever they came they would find me ready. I did not waste time on breakfast. That could wait. Meanwhile I fell to work with the materials in the yard. In addition to the handcart there was now a costler's barrow, the property of a greengrocer, to whom also belonged a quantity of lumber, including some bundles of stakes and several hampers filled with straw. With these materials, and those that I had borrowed from Mrs. Kosminsky, I began rapidly to build up a pair of life-size guys, one male and one female. I put them together very roughly, and sat them side by side in the barrow, leaning against the wall, and to each I attached a large ticket on which I scrawled the name of the person it represented, one being the highly unpopular minister, Mr. Todd Leakes, and the other the notorious Mrs. Gamway. They were very sketchily built, and would have dropped to pieces at a touch, but that was of no consequence. The time factor was the important one and I had worked at such speed that I had huddled them into a pretty plausible completeness when the inevitable peal at the house-bell disturbed my labors. I darted into the parlor, crammed a piece of bread into my mouth, and rushed to the shop-door, chewing frantically. As I opened the door, an agitated police inspector burst in, followed by a sergeant. "'Good morning, gentlemen,' I said suavely. "'Hair-cutting or shaving?' I shall not record the inspector's reply. I was really shocked. I had no idea that responsible officials used such language." In effect, they wished to look over the premises. Of course I gave them instant permission, and followed them in their tour of inspection on the pretext of showing them over the house. The inspector was in a very bad temper, and the sergeant was obviously depressed. They conversed in low tones as they stumped up the stairs, and I heard the sergeant say something about an awful suck-in. "'Oh, don't talk of it,' snapped the inspector. "'It's enough to make a cat sick. But what beats me is how those devils could have stuck the air of that room.' It would have settled my hash in five minutes. Yes, agreed the sergeant, and how they could have let themselves down from that window without being spotted. I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen the cord. The constables must have been asleep. Yes, grunted the inspector. Thick-headed louts. Let's have a look out here. He strode to the second floor back and threw open the window. Now you see, he continued, what I mean. This house has no connection with the next one. That projecting wing cuts it off. This back yard opens into Bell's Alley. The yard next door opens into Kosher Court. That's the way they went. They couldn't have got to this house excepting by the roof, and we've seen that they went down, not up. He stuck his head out the window and looked down sourly at the guys. Those things yours? he asked gruffly, pointing at the effigies. No, I answered. I think one of Piper's men is getting them ready to take round. The inspector grunted and moved away. He walked into the front room, looked in the cupboard, glanced round, and went downstairs. On the first floor he made a perfunctory inspection of the rooms, glancing in at my bedroom, and then went down to the ground floor. From thence the two officers descended to the cellar, which they examined more thoroughly, even prodding the sawdust in the bin, and so up to the back yard. Here, at the sight of the guise, the sergeant's woeful countenance brightened somewhat. Ha! he exclaimed. Mrs. Gamway! I saw a good deal of her when I was in the Westminster Division. I've often thought I'd like to, and, by Jiminy, I will! He squared up fiercely at the helpless-looking effigy of the lady, and, with a vicious round-arm punch, sent its unstable head flying across the yard. The blow, and its effect, seemed to rouse his destructive instincts, for he returned to the attack with such ferocity that in a few seconds he had reduced not only the fictitious Mrs. Gamway, but the right honorable Todd Leakes, also, into a heap of ruin. "'Stop that foolery, Smith,' 
snarled the inspector. You'll give the poor devil the trouble of building them up all over again. Come along. He unlocked the gate and stood for a moment looking back at me. I suppose you've heard nothing in the night, he said. Not a sound, I answered, adding. I shan't open the shop until the evening, and I shall probably go out for the day. Would you like to have the key? The inspector shook his head. No, I don't want the key. I've seen all I want to see. Good morning. He stumped out, followed by his subordinate. I drew a deep breath as I relocked the gate. I was glad he had refused the key, though I had thought it prudent to make the offer. Now I was at liberty to complete my arrangements at leisure. My first proceeding, after locking up the shop, was to rig up, with the greengrocer's stakes and Mrs. Kosminsky's cord, a pair of firm standards to support the guys. Then I took a hearty breakfast, after which I repaired to my bedroom, with a hamper of straw, a bundle of small stakes, and a quantity of old rags. The process of converting the specimens into quite convincing guys was not difficult. Tying up the heads in large pieces of rag, I fastened the big masks to the fronts of the globular bundles, and covered the remainder with the masses of oakum to form appropriate wigs. Each figure was then clothed in the bulky garments borrowed from Mrs. Kosminsky's stock, and well stuffed with straw, portions of which I allowed to protrude at all the apertures. A suitable stiffness was imparted to the limbs by pieces of stick poked up inside the clothing, and smaller sticks gave the correct, starfish-like spread of the gloved hands. When they were finished, the illusion was perfect. As the two effigies sat on the floor, with their backs against the wall, stiff, staring, bloated, and grotesquely horrible, not a soul would have suspected them. I carried the male guy down to the yard, sat him on the barrow, and put on his hat, taking with me the remains of the ruined guys, which I decided to put away in the drawers. I returned for the second effigy. I lashed the two figures very securely to the standards, fixing on their hats firmly, and attached the name cards. Then I went into the shop to attend to my own appearance. I had brought back from my Bloomsbury house the shabby overcoat and battered hat that I had worn on the last few expeditions. These I now assumed, and having fixed on my cheek a large cross of sticking plaster, which pulled down my eyebrow and pulled up the corner of my mouth, begrimed my face, reddened my nose, and carefully tinted in a not-too-empathetic black eye, I was sufficiently transmogrified to deceive even my intimate friends. Now I was ready to start, and now was the crucial moment. I went out into the yard, unlocked the gate, trundled the barrow out into the alley, and locked the gate behind me. At the moment there was not a soul in sight, but from the street close by came the unmistakable murmur of a large crowd. I must confess that I felt a little nervous. The next few minutes would decide my fate. I grasped the handles of the barrow and started forward resolutely. As I rounded the curve of the alley, a densely packed throng appeared ahead. Faces turned toward me and broke into grins. The murmur rose into a dull roar, and, as the people drew aside to make way for me, I plunged into the heart of the throng and raised my voice in a husky chant. "'Remember, remember the 5th of November, the gunpowder treason and plot!' Through the interstices of the crowd I could see the soldiers still drawn up by the curb, and even the machine-gun was yet in position. Suddenly the inspector and the sergeant appeared, bustling through the crowd. The former caught sight of me and, waving his hand angrily, shouted, "'Take that thing away from here! Move him out of the crowd, Maloney!' And a gigantic constable pounced on me with a broad grin, snatched the barrow-handles out of my hand, and started off at a trot that made the effigies rock in the most alarming manner. "'Holler, Bahoys!' shouted the grinning constable and the Bahoys complied with raucous enthusiasm. At the outskirts of the crowd Constable Maloney resigned in my favor, and it was at this moment that I noticed a manifest plain-clothes officer observing my exhibits with undue attention. But here fortune favored me, for the same instant I saw a man attempt to pick a pocket under the officer's very nose. The pickpocket caught my eye and moved off quickly. I pulled up, and pointing at the thief, bawled out, "'Stop that man! Stop him!' The pickpocket flung himself into the crowd and made off. The startled loafers drew hastily away from him. Men shouted, women screamed, and the plain-clothes officer started in pursuit. And in the whirling confusion that followed, I trundled away briskly into Middlesex Street and headed for Spitalfields. My progress through the squalid streets was quite triumphal. A large juvenile crowd attended me with appropriate vocal music, and adults cheered from the pavements, though no one embarrassed me with gifts. But, for all my outward gaiety, I was secretly anxious. It was barely ten o'clock, and many hours of the dreary November day had yet to run before it would be safe for me to approach my destination. 
the prospect of tramping the streets for some ten or twelve hours with this very conspicuous appendage was far from agreeable to say nothing of the increasing risk of detection and i look forward to it with gloomy forebodings if a suspicion arose i could be traced with the greatest ease and in any case i should be spent with fatigue before evening reflecting on these difficulties i had decided to seek some retired spot where i could dismount the effigies cover them with the tarpon that was rolled up in the barrow and take a rest when once more circumstances befriended me all through the night and the morning the ordinary winter haze had hung over the town but now by reason of a change of wind the haze began rapidly to thicken into a definite fog i set down the barrow and watched with thankfulness the mass opaque of yellow vapour filling the street and blotting out the sky as it thickened and the darkness closed in the children strayed away, and only one solitary loafer remained. "'Ard luck for you, mate, this ere fog,' he remarked. "'Adder you've took all that trouble, too.' He little knew how much. "'But it's no go. You better get him home whilst you can find your way. This is going to be a blackin'. I thanked him for his sympathy, and moved on into the darkening vapour. Close to Spittle Square I found a quiet corner where I quickly dismounted the guys, covered them with the tarpon, and— urged by a new anxiety from the rapidly growing density of the fog, groped my way on to Norton Folgate. Here I moved forward as quickly as I dared, turned up Great Eastern Street, and at length, to my great relief, came out on to Old Street. It was none too soon. As I entered the well-known thoroughfare, the fog closed down into impenetrable obscurity. The world of visible objects was extinguished and replaced by a chaos of confused sounds. Even the end of my barrow faded away into spectral uncertainty, and the curb against which I kept my left wheel grinding looked thin and remote. Opportune as the fog was, it was not without its dangers, of which the most immediate was that I might lose my way. I set down the barrow, and, detaching the little compass that I always carry in my watch-guard, laid it on the tarpon. My course, as I knew, lay about west-south-west, and with the compass before me I could not go far wrong. Indeed, its guidance was invaluable. Without it I could never have found my way through those miles of intricate streets. When a stationary wagon or other obstruction sent me out into the road, it enabled me to pick up the curb again unerringly. It mapped out the corners of the intersecting streets. It piloted me over the wide crossings of the city road and Aldersgate Street, and kept me happily confident of my direction as I groped my way like a fog-bound ship on an invisible sea. I went as quickly as was safe, but very warily, for a collision might have been fatal. Listening intently, with my eye on the compass and my wheel at the curb, I pushed on through the yellow void until a shadowy post at a street corner revealed itself by its parish initials as that at the intersection of Red Lion Street and Theobald's Row. I was nearly home. Another ten minutes' careful navigation brought me to a corner which I believed to be the one opposite my own house. I turned back a dozen paces, put down the barrow, and crossed the pavement, with a compass in my hand lest I should not be able to find the barrow again. I came against the jamb of a street door. I groped across the door itself. I found the keyhole of the familiar yell pattern. I inserted my key and turned it, and the door of the museum entrance opened. I had brought my ship into port. I listened intently. Someone was creeping down the street, hugging the railings. I closed the door to let him pass, and heard the groping hands sweep over the door as he crawled by. Then I went out, steered across to the barrow, picked up one of the specimens and carried it into the hall, where I laid it on the floor, returning immediately for the other. When both the specimens were safely deposited, I came out, softly closing the door after me with the key, and once more took up the barrow handles. Slowly I trundled the invaluable little vehicle up the street, never losing touch of the curb, flinging the stakes and cordage into the road as I went, until I had brought it to the corner of a street about a quarter of a mile from my house, and there I abandoned it, making my way back as fast as I could to the museum. My first proceeding on my return was to carry my treasures into the laboratory, light the gas, and examine their hair. I had really some hopes that one of them might be the man I sought, but, alas, it was the old story. They both had coarse black hair of the mongoloid type. My enemy was still to seek." Having cleaned away my make-up, I spent the rest of the day pushing forward the preliminary processes, so that these might be completed before decay's effacing fingers should obliterate the details of the integumentary structures. In the evening I returned to Whitechapel and opened the shop, 
proposing to purchase the dummy skeletons on the following day, and to devote the succeeding nights and early mornings to preparation of the specimens. The barrow turned up next day in the possession of an undeniable tramp who was trying to sell it for ten shillings, and who was accused of having stolen it, but was discharged for want of evidence. I compensated the green grocer for the trouble occasioned by my carelessness in leaving the back gate open, and thus the incident came to an end, with one important exception, for there was a very startling sequel. On the day after the expedition, I had the curiosity to open the panel and go through into the room that the murderers had occupied, which had now been locked up by the police. Looking round the room, my eye lighted on a shabby cloth cap lying on the still undisturbed mattress just below the pillow. I picked it up and looked it over curiously, for by its size I could see that it did not belong to either of the men whom I had secured. I took it over to the curtained window and carefully inspected its lining, and suddenly I perceived, clinging to the coarse cloth, a single short hair, which, even to the naked eye, had a distinctly unusual appearance. With a trembling hand I drew out my lens to examine it more closely, and, as it came into the magnified field, my heart seemed to stand still for, even at that low magnification, its character was unmistakable. It looked like a tiny string of pale gray beads. Grasping it in my fingers, I dashed through the opening, slammed the panels to, and rushed down to the parlor where I kept a small microscope. My agitation was so intense that I could hardly focus the instrument, but at last the object on the slide came into view, a broad, variegated stripe, with its dark medulla and the light rings of air bubbles at regular intervals. It was a typical ringed hair. And what was the inference? The hair was almost certainly Pirogov's. Pirogov was a burglar, a ruthless murderer, and he had ringed hair. The man whom I saw was a burglar, a ruthless murderer, and had ringed hair. Then Pirogov was my man. It was bad logic, but the probabilities were overwhelming and I had had the villain in the hollow of my hand, and he had gone forth unscathed. I ground my teeth with impotent rage. It was maddening. All the old passion and yearnings for retribution surged up in my breast once more. My interest in the new specimens almost died out. I wanted Pirogov, and it was only the new-born hope that I should yet lay my hand on him that carried me through that time of bitter disappointment. End of chapter 6 Chapter Seven, Part One of the Uttermost Farthing. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. The Uttermost Farthing by R. Austin Freeman. Chapter Seven, The Uttermost Farthing, Part One. Intense was the curiosity with which I turned to the last entry in Humphrey Challoner's museum archives. Not that I had any doubt as to the issue of the adventure that it recorded. I had seen the specimen numbered twenty-five in the shallow box and its identity had long since been evident. But this fact mitigated my curiosity not at all. The archives had furnished a continuous narrative, surely one of the strangest ever committed to writing, and now I was to read the climax of that romantically terrible story, to witness the final achievement of that object that my poor friend had pursued with such unswerving pertinacity. I extract the entire entry with the exception of one or two passages near the end, for the reasons the omission of which will be obvious to the reader. Circumstances attending the acquirement of the specimen numbered 25 in the anthropological series, A. Osteology, B. Reduced Dry Preparations. The months that followed the events connected with the acquirement of the specimens 23 and 24 brought me nothing but aching suspense and hope deferred. The pursuit of the common criminal I had abandoned since I had got scent of my real quarry, the concussor lay idle in the basket. The cellar steps were greased no more. I had but a passive role to play until the hour should strike to usher in the final scene, if that should ever be. Though the term of my long exile in East London was drawing nigh, its approach was unseen by me. I could but wait, and what is harder than waiting? I had made cautious inquiries among the alien population, but no one knew Pirogov, or, at least, admitted any knowledge of him, and as to the police, when they had made a few arrests and then released the prisoners, they appeared to let the matter drop. The newspapers were, of course, more active. One of them described circumstantially how the three anarchists who escaped from the house in Saul Street 
had been seen together in an East End restaurant, and several others followed from day to day the supposed whereabouts of a mysterious person known as Paul the Plumber, whom the police declared to be a picturesque myth. But for me there was one salient fact. Of those three ruffians, one was still at large, and no one seemed to have any knowledge of him. It was some four months later that I again caught up the scent. A certain Friday evening, early in February, found me listlessly tidying up the shop, for the Jewish Sabbath had begun and customers were few. But about eight o'clock a man strode in jauntily, hung up his hat and seated himself in the operating chair, and at that moment a second man entered and sat down to wait. I glanced at this latter, and in an instant my gorge rose at him, I cannot tell why. To the scientific mind intuitions are abhorrent. They are mostly wrong and wholly unreasonable. But as I looked at that man, a wave of instinctive dislike and suspicion swept over me. He was, indeed, an ill-looking fellow enough. A broad, lozenge-shaped tartar face, with great cheekbones and massive jaws, a low forehead surmounted by a dense brush of upstanding grayish hair, beetling brows and eyes deep-set, fierce and furtive, combined to make a sufficiently unprepossessing countenance. Nor was his manner more pleasing. He scowled forbiddingly at me, he scrutinized the other customer, craning sideways to survey him in the mirror. He looked about the shop and he stared inquisitively at the parlor door. Every movement was expressive of watchful, uneasy suspicion. I tried to avoid looking at him lest my face should betray me, and, to divert my thoughts, concentrated my attention on the other customer. The latter unconsciously gave me every assistance in doing so. Though by no means a young man, he was the vainest and most dandified client I had ever had under my hands. He stopped me repeatedly to give exhaustive directions as to the effect that he desired me to produce. He examined himself in the glass and consulted me anxiously as to the exact disposition of an artificially curled forelock. I cursed him inwardly, for I wanted him to be gone and leave me alone with the other man, but for that very reason, and that I might conceal my impatience, I did his bidding, and treated him with elaborate care. But now and again my glance would stray to the other man. And as I caught his fierce, suspicious eye, like the eye of a hunted animal, I would look away quickly, lest he should read what was in my mind. At length I had finished with my dandy client. I had brushed his hair to a nicety, and had even curled his forelock with heated tongs. With a sigh of relief I took off the cloth, and waited for him to rise. But he rose not. Stroking his cheek critically, he decided that he wanted shaving, and, cursing him in my heart, I had to comply. I had acquired some reputation as a barber, and, I think, deserved it. I could put a perfect edge on a razor, and I wielded the instrument with a sensitive hand and habitual care. My client appreciated my skill, and complimented me patronizingly, in very fair English, though with a slight Russian accent, delaying me intolerably to express his approval. When I had shaved him, he asked for pink powder to be applied to his chin, and when I had powdered him, he directed me to shape his mustache with pate hongris, a process which he superintended with anxious care. At last the fellow was actually finished. He got up from the chair and surveyed himself in the large wall mirror. He turned his head from side to side, and tried to see the back of it. He smiled into the mirror, raised his eyebrows, frowned, and, in fact, tried a variety of expressions and effects, including a slight and graceful bow. Then he approached the glass to examine a spot on his cheek, leaned against it with outspread hands to inspect his teeth, and finally put out his tongue to examine that, too. I almost expected that he would ask me to brush it. However, he did not. Adjusting his necktie delicately, he handed me my fee with a patronizing smile and remarked, "'You are a good barber. You have taste, and you take trouble.' I give you a penny for yourself, and I shall come to you again. As the door closed behind him, I turned to the other customer. He rose, walked over to the operating chair, and sat down sullenly, keeping an eye on me all the time, and something in his face, expressive of suspicion, uneasiness, and even fear, seemed to hint at something unusual in my own appearance. It was likely enough, hard as I had struggled to smother the tumult of emotions that seethed within me, some disturbance must have reached the surface, some light in the eye, some tension of the mouth to tell of the fierce excitement, the raging anxiety, that possessed me. I was afraid to look at him for fear of frightening him away. Was he the man? 
Was this the murderer, Piragov, the slayer of my wife? The question rang in my ears as, with a far from steady hand, I slowly lathered his face. Instinct told me that he was, but even in my excitement reason rejected a mere unanalyzable belief. For what is an intuition? Brutally stated, it is simply a conclusion reached without premises. I had always disbelieved in instinct and intuition, and I disbelieved still. But what had made me connect this man with Piragoff? He was clearly a Russian. He looked like a villain. He had the manner of a nihilist or violent criminal of some kind. But all this was nothing. It formed no rational basis for the conviction that possessed me. There was his hair, of course, a wiry mop of queer, grayish-brown. It might well, from its color, be ringed hair. And if it was, I should have little doubt of the man's identity. But was it? I was getting on in years, and could not see near objects clearly without my spectacles, and I had laid down my spectacles somewhere in the parlor. As I lathered his face, I leaned over him to look at his hair more closely, but he shrank away in fierce alarm, and, after all, my eyesight was not good enough. Once I tried to get out my lens, but he challenged me furiously as to my object, and I put it away again. I dared not provoke him to violence, for if he had struck me, I should have killed him on the spot, and he might be the wrong man. The operation of shaving him was beset with temptations from moment to moment. Forgotten anatomical details revived in my memory. I found myself tracing through the coarse skin those underlying structures that were so near to hand. Now I was at the angle of the jaw, and as the ringed blade swept over the skin I traced the edge of the strap-like muscle, and mentally marked the spot where it crossed the great carotid artery. I could even detect the pulsation of the vessel. How near it was to the surface! A little dip of the razor's beak at that spot. But still I had no clear evidence that he was the right man, a mere impression, a feeling of physical repulsion unsupported by any tangible fact, was not enough to act on. One moment a savage impatience for retribution urged me to take the chance, to fell him with a blow and fling him down into the cellar. The next, my reason stepped in and bade me to hold my hand and wait for proof, and all the time he watched me like a cat and kept his hands thrust into the hip pockets of his coat. Again and again these mental oscillations occurred. Now I was simply and savagely homicidal, and now I was rational, almost judicial. Now the vital necessity was to prevent his escape, and yet, again, I shrank from the dreadful risk of killing an innocent man. What the issue might have been I cannot say, but suddenly the door opened, a burly carter entered and sat down, and the opportunity was gone. The Russian waited for no lengthy inspection in the glass like his predecessor. As soon as he was finished he sprang from the chair, slapped down his coppers in payment and darted out of the shop only too glad to take himself off in safety. There must have been something very sinister in my appearance. The carter seated himself in the chair, and I fell to work on him mechanically, but my thoughts were with the man who was gone. What a fiasco it had been! After waiting all these years, I had met a man whom I suspected to be the very wretch I sought. I had actually been alone with him, and I had let him go. The futility of it! Before my eyes the grinning tenants of the great wall-case rose in reproach. The little, impassive faces in those shallow boxes seemed to look at me and ask why they had been killed. I had let the man go, and he would certainly never come to my shop again. True, I should know him again, but what better chance could I ever have of identifying him? And then again came the unanswerable question. Was he really the man, after all? So my thoughts fluttered to and fro. Constant, only, was a feeling of profound dejection, a sense of unutterable, irretrievable failure. The carter, a regular customer, rose and looked askance at me as he rubbed his face with the towel. He remarked that I seemed to be feeling a bit dull to-night, paid his fee, and, with a civil good evening, took his departure. When he had gone I stood by the chair wrapped in a gloomy reverie. Had I failed, finally? Was my long quest at an end with my object unachieved? It almost seemed so. I raised my eyes, and they fell on my reflection in the large mirror, and suddenly it was borne in on me that I was an old man. The passing years of labor and mental unrest had left deep traces. My hair, which was black when I first came to the East, was now snow-white, 
and the face beneath it was worn and wrinkled and aged. The sands of my life were running out apace. Soon the last grains would trickle out of the glass, and then would come the end, the futile end, with the task still unaccomplished. And for this I had dragged out these twenty weary years, ever looking for repose and eternal reunion. How much better to have spent those years in the peace of the tomb by the dear companion of my sunny hours. I stepped up to the glass and looked more closely at my face, to mark the crow's feet and intersecting wrinkles in the shrunken skin. Yes, it was an old, old face, a weary face, too, that spoke of sorrow and anxious thought and strenuous, unsatisfying effort. And presently it would be a dead face, calm and peaceful enough then, and the wretch who had wrought all the havoc would still stalk abroad with his heavy debt unpaid. Something on the surface of the mirror interposed between my eye and the reflection, slightly blurring the image. I focused on it with some difficulty, and then saw that it was a group of finger-marks, the prints made by the greasy fingers of my dandy customer when he had leaned on the glass to inspect his teeth. As they grew distinct to my vision, I was aware of a curious sense of familiarity, at first merely subconscious and not strongly attracting my attention. But this state lasted only for a few brief moments. Then the vague feeling burst into full recognition. I snatched out my lens and brought it to bear on those astounding impressions. My heart thumped furiously. A feeling of awe, of triumph, of fierce joy and fiercer rage surged through me, and mingled with profound self-contempt. There could be no mistake. I looked at those fingerprints too often. Every ridge mark, every loop and whirl of the varying patterns was engraved on my memory. For twenty years I had carried the slightly enlarged photographs in my pocket-book, and hardly a day had passed without my taking them out to con them afresh. I had them in my pocket now to justify rather than aid my memory. I held the open book before the glass and compared the photographs with the clearly printed impressions. There were seven fingerprints on the mirror, four on the right hand and three on the left, and all were identical with the corresponding prints on the photographs. No doubt was possible. But if it had been... I darted across to the chair. The floor was still littered with the cuttings from that villain's head. In my idiotic preoccupation with the other man, I had let that wretch depart without a glance at his hair. I grabbed up a tuft from the floor and gazed at it. Even to the unaided eye, it had an unusual quality when looked at closely, a soft, shimmering appearance like that of some delicate textile. But I gave it only a single glance. Then rushing through to the parlor, I spread a few hairs on a glass slip and placed it on the stage of the microscope. A single glance clenched the matter, as I put my eye to the instrument there, straying across the circular field, where the broad gray stripes, each with its dark line of medulla obscured at intervals by rings of tiny bubbles. The demonstration was conclusive. This was the very man. Humanly speaking, no error or fallacy was possible. I stood up and laughed grimly. So much for instinct for what fools call intuition and wise men recognize as mere slipshod reasoning. I could understand my precious intuition now, could analyze it into its trumpery constituents. It was the old story. Unconsciously I had built up the image of a particular kind of man, and when such a man appeared I had recognized him at a glance. The villainous tartar face, I had looked for it. The fierce, furtive, hunted manner, the restless suspicion, the mop of grayish-brown hair. I had expected them all, and there they were. My man would have these peculiarities, and here was a man who had them. He, therefore, was the man I sought. Oh, good old, undistributed middle term! How many intuitions have been born of you? My triumph was short-lived. A moment's reflection sobered me. True, I had found my murderer, but I had lost him again. That bird of ill omen was still a bird in the bush, in the tangled bush of criminal London. He had said that he would come back to me again, and I hoped he would, but who could say? Other eyes than mine were probably looking for him. I suppose I am by nature an optimist, otherwise I should not have continued the pursuit all these years. Hence, having mastered the passing disappointment, I settled myself patiently to wait in the hope of my victim's ultimate reappearance. Not entirely passively, however, for, after the shop was shut, 
I went abroad nightly to frequent the foreign restaurants and other less reputable places of the East End, in the hopes of meeting him and jogging his memory. The active employment kept my mind occupied and made the time of waiting seem less long, but it had no further result. I never met the man, and, as the weeks passed without bringing him to my net, I had the uncomfortable feeling that his hair must have grown and been trimmed by someone else, unless, indeed, he had fallen into the clutches of the law. Meanwhile, I quietly made my preparations, which involved one or two visits to a ship chandler's, and laid down a scheme of action. It would be a delicate business. The villain was some fifteen years younger than I, a sturdy ruffian and desperate, as I had seen. My own strength and activity had been failing for some time now. Obviously I could not meet him on equal terms. Moreover, I must not allow him to injure me. That was a point of honor. This was to be no trial by wager of battle. It was to be an execution. Any retaliation by him would destroy the formal, punitive character, which was the essence of the transaction. The weeks sped by. They lengthened into months, and still my visitor made no appearance. My anxiety grew. There were times when I looked at my white hair and doubted, when I almost despaired. But those times passed, and my spirits revived. On the whole, I was hopeful and waited patiently, and in the end my hopes were justified and my patience rewarded. It was a fair evening early in June, Wednesday evening, I recollect, when at last he came. Fortunately the shop was empty, and again, oddly enough, it was some Jewish holiday. I welcomed him effusively. No fierce glare came from my eyes now. I was delighted to see him, and he was flattered at the profound impression his former visit had made on me. I began very deliberately, for I could hardly hold the scissors and was afraid that he would notice the tremor, which, in fact, he did. "'Why does your hand shake so much, Mr. Vosper?' he asked in his excellent English. "'You have not been curling your little finger, Hein?' I reassured him on this point, but used a little extra caution until the tremor should subside, which it did as soon as I got over my first excitement. Meanwhile I let him talk. He was a boastful, egotistical oaf, as might have been expected, and I flattered and admired him until he fairly purred with self-satisfaction. It was very necessary to get him into a good humor. My terror from moment to moment was that some other customer should come in, though a holiday evening was usually a blank in a business sense until the Christian shops shut. Still, it was a serious danger which impelled me to open my attack with as little delay as possible. I had several alternative plans, and I commenced with the one that I thought most promising. Taking advantage of a little pause in the conversation, I said, in a confidential tone, "'I wonder if you can give me a little advice. I want to find somebody who will buy some valuable property without asking too many questions, and who won't talk about the deal afterwards. A safe person, you know. Can you recommend me such a person?' He turned in the chair and looked at me. All his self-complacent smiles were gone in an instant. The face that looked into mine was the face of as sinister a villain as I have ever clapped eyes on. "'The person you mean,' he said fiercely, "'is a fence, a receiver. Why do you ask me if I know a fence? Who are you? Are you a spy for the police, Hein? What should I know about receivers? Answer me that.' He glared at me with such furious suspicion that I instinctively opened my scissors and looked at the neighborhood of his carotid. But I took his question quite pleasantly. "'That's what they all say,' I remarked with a foolish smile. "'Who do?' he demanded. "'Everybody that I ask. They all say, "'What should I know about fences? It's very inconvenient for me.' "'Why is it inconvenient to you?' he asked less savagely, and with evidently awakening curiosity. I gave an embarrassed cough. "'Well, you see, it's this way. "'Supposing I have some property, valuable property, "'but of a kind that is of no use to me. "'Naturally I want to sell it, but I don't want it talked about. "'I am a poor man. "'If I am known to be selling things of value, "'people may make uncharitable remarks, "'and busybodies may ask inconvenient questions. "'You see my position?' "'Piergoff looked at me fixedly, eagerly. "'A new light was in his eye now. "'What have you got?' he demanded. I coughed again. Aha, I said with a smile. It is you who are asking questions now. But you ask me to advise you. How can I if I don't know what you've got to sell? Perhaps I might buy the stuff myself, Hein? 
"'I think not,' said I, "'unless you can write a check for four figures. "'But perhaps you can.' "'Yes, perhaps I can, or perhaps I can get the money. "'Tell me what the stuff is.' "'I clipped away at the top of my speed, "'and I could cut hair very quickly if I tried. "'No fear of his slipping away now. "'I had him fast. "'It's a complicated affair,' I said hesitatingly, "'and I don't want to say much about it if you're not in the line.' I thought you might be able to put me on to a safe man in the regular trade. Piragoff moved impatiently, then glanced at the parlor door. Anyone in that room? he asked. No, I answered. I live here all alone. No servant? No one to look after you? He asked the questions with ill-concealed eagerness. No, I look after myself. It's cheaper, and I want so little. The last statement I made in accordance with a curious fact that I had observed, which is that the really infallible method of impressing a stranger with your wealth, is to dilate on your poverty. The statement had its usual effect. Piragoff fidgeted slightly, glanced at the shop door, and said, Finish my hair quickly, and let us go in there and talk about this. I chuckled inwardly at his eagerness. Even his personal appearance had become a secondary consideration. I bustled through the rest of the operation whisked off the cloth, and opened the parlor door. He rose, glanced at his reflection in the glass, looked quickly at the shop door, and followed me into the little room, shutting and bolting the door after him. End of chapter 7, part 1《The Uttermost Farthing by R. Austin Freeman》Chapter 7. The Uttermost Farthing. Part 2. I watched him closely. I am no believer in the rubbish called telepathy, but, by observing a person's face and actions, it is not difficult to trace the direction of his thoughts. Piragoff gazed round the room with the frank curiosity of the barbarian, and the look of pleased surprise that he bestowed on the safe, and the way in which his glance travelled from that object to my person, were easy enough to interpret. Here was an iron safe, presumably containing valuables, and here was an elderly man with the key of that safe in his pocket. The corollary was obvious. "'Is that another room?' he asked, pointing to the cellar door. I threw it open, and let him look into the dark cavity. "'That,' I said, "'is the cellar. It has a door opening into the back yard, which has a gate that opens into Bell's Alley. It might be useful. Don't you think so?' He did think so, very emphatically to judge by his expression." Very useful indeed when you have knocked down an old man and rifled his safe, to have a quiet exit at the back. "'Now tell me about this stuff,' said he. "'Have you got it here?' "'The fact is,' I said confidentially, "'I haven't got it at all. Yet.' His face fell perceptibly at this. "'But,' I added, "'I can get it when I like, when I have arranged about disposing of it.' "'But you've got a safe to keep it in,' he protested. "'Yes, but I don't want to have it here.' Besides, that safe won't hold it all, if I take over the whole lot. Piragoff's eyes fairly bulged with greed and excitement. What sort of stuff is it? Silver? There is some silver, I said superciliously, a good deal, in fact, but that's hardly worth while. You see, the stuff is a collection. It belongs at present to one of those fools who collect jewelry and church plate, monstrances, jeweled chalices, and things of that kind. Piragoff lipped his lips. Aha, he said. I am that sort of fool myself. He laughed uneasily, being evidently sorry he had spoken, and continued. And you can get all this when you want it, hein? But where is it now? I smiled slyly. It is in a sort of private museum, but where that museum is I am not going to say, or perhaps I may find it empty when I call. Piragoff looked at me earnestly. He had evidently written me down for an abject fool, and no wonder— and was considering how to manage me. But this place, this museum, it must be a strong place. How are you going to get in? Will you ring the bell? I shall let myself in with a latch-key, I said jauntily. Have you got the latch-key? Yes, and I have tried it. I have it from a friend who lives there. Piergoff laughed outright. And she gave you the latch-key, Hein? Ha, ha! But you are a wicked old man, and it is strange, too. He glanced from me to his reflection in the little mirror over the safe, and his expression said as plainly as words, 
Now, if she had given it to me, one could understand it. But, he continued, when you are inside, the stuff will be locked up. You are skillful, perhaps? You can open a safe, for instance? You have tried? No, I have never actually tried, but it's easy enough. I've often opened packing cases, and I don't think there is an iron safe. They are wooden cabinets. It will be quite easy. Bah! Packing cases! exclaimed Peregoff. He grasped my coat sleeve excitedly. I tell you, my friend, it's not easy. It is very difficult, I tell you this. I, who know. I am not in the line myself, but I have a friend who does these things, and he has shown me. I have some skill, though I practice only for sport, you understand. It is very difficult. You shall let yourself in, you shall find the stuff locked up, you shall try to open the cabinet, and you shall only make a great noise. Then you shall come away empty, like a fool, and the police shall set a watch on the house. The chance is gone, and you have nothing. I scratched my head like the fool that he thought me. That would be rather awkward, I admitted. Awkward, he exclaimed. It would be wicked. The chance of a lifetime gone. Now, if you take with you a friend who has skill, Hein? Ah, I said craftily. But this is my little nest egg. If I take a friend, I shall have to share. But there is enough for two. If your safe will not hold it, there is more than you can carry. Besides, your friend shall not be greedy. If he takes a third, or say a quarter, how much is the stuff worth? The collection is said to be worth a hundred thousand pounds. A hundred thousand? gasped Piergoff. He was almost foaming at the mouth. A hundred thousand? That would be twenty-five for me, for your friend, and seventy-five for you. It is impossible for one man. You could not carry it, my friend. Again he grasped my sleeve persuasively. I will come with you. I am very skillful. I am strong. I am brave. You shall be safe with me. I will be your comrade, and you shall give a quarter, or even less, if you like. He could afford to make easy terms under the circumstances. I reflected a while, and at length said, Perhaps you are right. Some of these things are large, and gold is heavy. We should leave the silver. It would take two to carry it all. Yes, you shall come with me and bring the necessary tools. When shall we do it? Any night will do for me. He reflected with an air of slight embarrassment, and then asked, Do you open your shop on Sunday? The question took a load off my mind. I had been speculating on what plan of action he would adopt. Now I knew, and his plan would suit me to a nicety. No, I said, I never open on Sunday. Then, said he, we will do the job on Saturday night or Sunday morning. That will give us a quiet day to break up the stuff. Yes, that would be a good arrangement. Will you come here on Saturday night and start with me? No, no, he replied, that would never do. We must not be seen together. Give me a rendezvous. We will meet near the place. Quite so. It would never do for us to be seen together in Whitechapel, where we were both known. The fact might be mentioned at the inquest. It would be most inconvenient for Piragoff. And, look you, he continued, wear a top hat and good clothes. If you have an evening suit, put it on, and bring a new gladstone bag with some clothes in it. Where will you meet me? I mentioned Upper Bedford Place and suggested half-past twelve, to which he agreed, and, after sending me out to see that the coast was clear, he took his leave, twisting his waxed moustache as he went out. I was, on the whole, very pleased with the arrangement. Particularly pleased was I with Piragoff's transparent plan for disposing of me. For, now that it really came to action, I found myself shying somewhat at the office of executioner, though I meant to do my duty all the same. But the fact that this man was already arranging coolly to murder me made my task less unpalatable. The British sporting instinct is incurable. Piragoff's scheme was perfectly simple. We should go together to the house, we should bring away the spoil, I carrying half, convey it to my premises in Saul Street early on Sunday morning. Then we should break up the stuff, and when our labors were concluded, and I was of no further use, he would knock me on the head. The quiet back gate would enable him to carry away the booty in installments to his lodgings. Then he would lock the gate and vanish. In a few days the police would break into my house and find my body, and Mr. Piragoff, in his hotel at, say, Amsterdam, would read an account of the inquest. It was delightfully simple and effective, but it failed to take into account the player on the opposite side of the board. The interval between Wednesday and Saturday was a time of anxious thought and considerable excitement. 
I went out every night and had the pleasure of discovering that I was honoured by the attendance, at a little distance, of Mr. Piragoff. One evening only I eluded him, and watched him drive off furiously in a hansom in pursuit of another hansom, which was supposed to contain me. On that night I visited the museum. Not that I had anything special to do. My very complete and even elaborate arrangements had been made some time before, and now I had only to look them over and see that they were in going order, to test, for instance, the brass handle that was connected with the electric main, to see that the well-oiled blocks of a couple of purchase tackles ran smoothly and silently. Everything was in working trim, even to the concussor, stowed out of sight, but within easy reach, in its narrow basket. Saturday night arrived in due course. I shut up the shop at nine, put on evening clothes, took the newly purchased Gladstone, and hailed a hansom. I drove, in the first place, to the Satyrian restaurant and dined delicately, but substantially, carefully avoiding indigestible dishes. From the restaurant I drove to the museum, where I loitered, making a final inspection of my arrangements, until twenty-five minutes past twelve. Then I came forth and walked quietly to Upper Bedford Place. As I turned the corner and looked down the wide thoroughfare, the long stretch of pavement contained but a single figure, a dim, dark bolt on the grey of the midsummer night. It moved towards me, and, resolving itself into a definite shape, showed me Piragoff in evening dress, enveloped in a voluminous overcoat, and carrying a small handbag. "'You are punctual, Vosper,' he said graciously. "'Shall we make our visit now? Is the house quiet yet? These are not, you see.' He nodded at the boarding-houses that we were passing, several of which still showed lights in the windows. "'Our house has settled down,' I answered. "'The collector is an early bird. I have just been past it to see that all the lights were out.' We walked quickly across the square towards the neighborhood of my house. Piragoff was very affable. He conversed cheerfully as we went and gave a pleasant good night to a policeman, who touched his helmet civilly in response. When I halted at the door of the museum, he looked about him with a slight frown. "'I seem to know this place,' he murmured. "'Yes, I have been here before. Many years ago. Yes. Yes, I remember.' He laughed softly, as if recalling an amusing incident. I set my teeth inserted the key, and pushed the door open. Enter, I said. He stepped into the hall. I followed and softly closed the door, slipping up the catch as the lock clicked. It was a small precaution, but enough to hinder a hasty retreat. I piloted him through the museum and switched on a single electric lamp which filled the great room with a ghostly twilight. Piragoff looked about him inquisitively, and his eye fell on the long wall-case with dimly seen, pallid shapes of the company within it. His face blanched suddenly, and he stared with wide-open eyes. "'God!' he exclaimed. "'What are those things?' "'Those skeletons,' said I. "'They are part of the collection. The fellow who owns this place hoards all sorts of trash. Come round and have a look at them.' "'But skeletons,' he whispered. "'Skeletons of men. Ah, I do not like them.' Nevertheless, he followed me round the room, peering in nervously at the case of skulls as we passed. I walked him slowly past the whole length of the wall-case, and he stared in at the twenty-four motionless, white figures, shuddering audibly. I must admit that their appearance was very striking in that feeble light. Their poses were so easy and natural, and their faces, modelled by broad shadows, so singularly expressive. I was very pleased with the effect. "'But they are horrible,' gasped Piragoff. "'They seem to be alive. They seem to beckon to one, to say, "'Come in here.' Come in and stay with us. Ah, they are dreadful. Let us go away from them. He stole on tiptoe to the other side of the room and stood positively shaking, shaking at the sight of a mere collection of dry bones. It was amazing. I have often been puzzled by the odd, superstitious fear with which ignorant people view these interesting and beautiful structures. But surely this was an extreme case. Here was a callous wretch who would murder without a scruple a young and lovely woman and laugh at the recollection of the atrocity, and he was actually terrified at the sight of a few irregularly shaped fragments of phosphate of lime and gelatine. I repeated, it was amazing. Piragoff recovered only to develop the ferocity of a frightened ruffian. "'Where is the stuff, fool?' he demanded. "'Show it to me quickly, or I will cut your throat. Quick! Let us get it and go!' I watched him warily. 
These neurotic Slav criminals, when they get into a state of panic, are like frightened cats, very dangerous to be near. And the more frightened, the more dangerous. I must keep an eye on Pirogov. I can open one of the cabinets, I said. Then open it, pig. Open it quickly. I want to get away from this place. He grinned at me like an angry monkey, and I led him to the secret cupboard. As I very deliberately turned the hidden catches and prepared to take out the panel, I considered whether it was not time to set the apparatus going, for I had prepared a little surprise for Pirogov, and I was now rather doubtful how he would take it. Besides, I was not enjoying the proceedings as much as I had expected to. Pirogov's lack of nerve was disconcerting. However, I took out the panel and stood by to watch the result. Pirogov peered into the cupboard and uttered a growl of disappointment. "'There's nothing here but books in these boxes. Lift the boxes down, pig, and let us see what is in them.' I lifted the boxes from the shelf. They are very light, I said, and here are two pistols on top of them. These pistols were the surprise that I had prepared in a spirit of mischief. I had taken them from the pockets of the last two specimens and kept them for the sake of the devices that the two imbeciles had scratched on the butts. Pistols, exclaimed Pirogov, let me look at them. He snatched the weapons from the top of the box and took them over to the lamp. Immediately I heard a gasp of astonishment. God, but this is a strange thing. Here is Louis Plotkovich's pistol, and this other belonged to Boris Lobodinsky. They have been here, too. He stared at me, open-mouthed, holding the pistols, which I had carefully unloaded, one in each trembling hand. What little nerve he had was going fast. I laid the boxes on a small table, and switched on the lamp that hung close over it. High up above the table was one of the cross-beams of the roof. From the beam there hung down two purchase tackles. The tail-rope of each tackle ended in a noose that was hitched on a hook on the wall, and the falls of the two tackles were hitched lightly over two other hooks. But none of these appliances was visible. The shaded lamp threw its bright light on the table only. Piergoff came across the room and laid down the pistols. "'Open those boxes,' he said gruffly, "'and let us see what is in them.' I took off the lid of one, and Piergoff started back with a gasp but came back, snuffing at the box like a frightened animal. "'What the devil are these things?' he demanded in a hoarse whisper. "'They look like dolls' heads,' I answered. "'They look like dead men's heads,' he whispered shudderingly. "'Only they are too small. They are dreadful. This collector man is a devil. I should like to kill him.' He glared with horrid fascination at the little dry preparations. There were eight in this box— each in its own little black velvet compartment, with its number and date on the label. I opened the second box, also containing eight, and he stared into that with the same shuddering fascination. "'What do you suppose these dates mean?' he whispered. "'I suppose,' I replied, "'those are the dates when he acquired them. Here is another box. This, the last one, was intended to hold nine heads, but it contained only eight, at present. There was an empty compartment of red velvet in the middle.' on either side of which were the heads of the last two specimens, twenty-three and twenty-four. I took off the lid, and stood back to see what would happen. Piergoff stared into the box without speaking for two or three seconds. Suddenly he uttered a shriek. It is Boris! Boris and Louis Plotkovich! His figure stiffened. He stood rigid with his hands on his thighs, leaning over the box, his hair bristling, his white face running with sweat his jaw dropped, the very personification of horror, and, of a sudden, he began to tremble violently. I looked at him with disgust and an instantaneous revulsion of feeling. What? Should I call in the aid of all those elaborate appliances to dispatch a poor trembling devil like this? I would have none of them. The concussor was good enough for him. Nay, it was too good." I reached out behind me and lifted one of the nooses from its hook. Its own weight had nearly closed the loop, for the steel eyelet spliced into the end ran very easily and smoothly on the well-greased rope. I opened the loop wide and, leaning toward Pirogov from behind, quietly dropped it over his shoulders, pulling it tight as it fell to the level of his elbows. He sprang up, but at that instant I kicked away one of his feet and pushed him to the unsupported side when he fell sprawling face downwards. I gave another tug at the rope, and, as he struggled to get to his feet, I snatched the fall of the tackle from its hook, and ran away with it, hauling as I went. 
Looking back, I saw Piragoff slowly rise to the pull of the tackle until he was upright with his feet just touching the floor. Then I belayed the fall securely to one of a pair of cleats and approached him. Hitherto sheer amazement had kept him silent, but as I drew near him he gave a yell of terror. This would not do. Taking the gag from the place where I had hidden it in readiness, I came behind him and stuffed it over his mouth where I secured it, cautiously evading his attempts to clutch at me. It was a poor gag, having no tongue-piece, but it answered its purpose, for it reduced his shouts to mere muffled bellowings, inaudible outside. Now that the poor wretch was pinioned and gagged and helpless, my feelings urged me to get the business over quickly. But certain formalities had to be observed. It was an execution. I stepped in front of the prisoner and addressed him. "'Listen to me, Piragoff. At the sound of his name he stopped bellowing and stared at me, and I continued— Twenty years ago a burglar came to this house. He was in the dining-room at two o'clock in the morning, preparing to steal the plate. A lady came into the room and disturbed him. He tried to prevent her from ringing the bell, but she rang it, and he shot her dead. I need not tell you, Piragoff, who that burglar was, but I will tell you who I am. I am the husband of that lady. I have been looking for you for twenty years, and now I have caught you, and you have got to pay the penalty of that murder." As I ceased speaking, he broke out into fresh bellowings. He wagged his head from side to side, and the tears coursed down his ghastly face. It was horrible. Trembling myself from head to foot, I took the second noose from its hook, passed it over his head, and quickly adjusted it. Then I snatched the second fall, and walked away with it, gathering in the slack. As the rope tightened in my hand, the bellowing suddenly ceased. I never looked back. I continued to haul until I felt the tackle-blocks come together. I belayed the rope to the second cleat, and set a half-hitch on the turns. Then I walked out of the museum and shut the door. It had been very different from what I had anticipated. As I sat by the laboratory table with my head buried in my hands, I shook as if I had an ague. My skin was bathed in a cold sweat, and I felt that it would have been a relief to weep. I was astonished at myself. Twenty-four of these vermin I had exterminated with a light heart, because the blow was dealt in the heat of conflict. And now, because this wretch had been helpless and unresisting, I was nearly broken with the effort of dispatching him. I sat in the dark laboratory, slowly recovering and thinking of the long years that had slipped away since the hand of this miscreant had robbed me of my darling. Gradually I grew more calm. But fully an hour passed before I could summon resolution to go back into the museum, and satisfy myself that the long outstanding debt had indeed been paid at last to the uttermost farthing. On Monday morning I withdrew from my bank a hundred pounds in notes, which I handed to my landlord's widow, Mr. Nathan had died some years previously, with a note surrendering the shop and the house in Saul Street. I emptied the safe and brought away such things as I cared to keep, leaving the rest for Mrs. Nathan. Then I shaved off my ragged beard and white moustache, set my Bloomsbury house in order, pensioned off the sergeant-major, who was now growing an old man, and engaged a set of respectable servants. When the last specimen was finished and put in its place in the museum, my work was done. I had now only to wait quietly for the end, and for that I am now waiting. I hope not impatiently. Something tells me that I have not long to wait. Certain new and strange sensations, which I have discussed with my friend Dr. Wharton, seem to herald a change. Wharton makes light of them, but I think and hope he is mistaken, and in that hope I rest content, believing that soon I shall hear the curfew chime steal out of the evening mist, to tell me that the day is over, and that my little spark may be put out. The End End of Chapter 7 and End of the Uttermost Farthing Read by Marianne Spiegel in Chicago, Illinois, December thirty-first, two 2009